Hello YouTube, this video will be on aquarium substrates. For the planted tank folks, Ophthalm substrate is seen merely as a medium for keeping plants down and for providing nutrients to plants. However, substrate also provides many other functions in the tank. It provides a home for beneficial bacteria and bacterial reactions in the fish tank are very important. It can be used for aesthetics. Nowadays, uh, when aquascaping, quite often we use decorative sand instead of soil. If your substrate is acidic, it also has the additional effect of being able to buffer your water parameters. People often view substrate as a distinct entity from the water column, but in fact, uh, they both interact with each other continually. There is a constant exchange of gases as well as other nutrients and chemical compounds between the water column and the substrate. When you fertilize the water column, the first well accumulate in the substrate and if you are using an extremely rich substrate, the nutrients well leak into the water column as well. There is a constant flow of water as well as interaction between these two layers. Iron is most usable by plants in its chelated Fe2 plus format. However, in most tanks, because iron is reactive, it is rapidly oxidized and precipitated. It may remain in the water as a suspension or it may enter the substrate. If it enters the substrate, bacteria action can reduce the iron from Fe3 plus format back to Fe2 plus format, which is preferred by plants for uptake. I think that there is also a fair bit of fear and misconception about using deeper substrates in planted tank with the idea that if you have a substrate that is too deep, you get anaerobic conditions and your plant will die. Things just don't work that way and there are two parts to this. Firstly, plants channel oxygen down to their root zones. So where their roots reach, those areas of the substrate will be reasonably well aerated by the roots themselves. Secondly, even if you have a deep substrate, the upper zones will have access to the water column and aerobic bacteria there will oxidize harmful gases that rise from the bottom. This is how natural lakes survive. There is no limit to how deep you know, natural systems go. Deep substrates can and well work if it is set up correctly. I like to use a system similar to how natural wetland soils are layered. I prefer to use a thinner cap because the cap's purpose is to prevent the debris from the soil from mixing the water column. Its job is not to prevent water interaction with the substrate. Next, I'll keep the layers that are higher in organics closer to the surface. This will include things like compost. Generally, the darker the color of your soil, the more organic material it contains. The more organic material it contains, the more bacterial action there is and the greater the draw for oxygen. Organic matter has also the highest cation exchange capacity among substrates. This means that it has the greatest uh, ability to bind to nutrients and make them available to plants. For the deeper layers of the soil, I will use a less organic heavy soil to prevent overactive anaerobic bacteria. If you use iron fertilizer, however, it, it should be placed deep where there is the lowest redox and bacteria will render the iron into usable form for the plants. The next idea that I want to discuss is the idea that there are some plants that are root feeders or others take in you know, nutrients through their leaves mainly. Is this actually true? In nature, soil is where the nutrients gather due to gravity and as well as the flow of water. The roots can then uptake this uh, nutrients through exchange of ions and then it needs to be transported up the stem of the tree to its leaves and the other growing parts. There is actually a measurable lag time for this effect. Way back in the 1950s, it was discovered that trees and most plants absorb nutrients directly through their bark as well as leaves. And the technique of foliar feeding was popularized due to its many advantages. Applying first to the leaves and bark of the tree achieved a very high absorption rate and there was no lag time because the plant need not transport the nutrient from the roots. Also, it could be used to cure plants that had damaged root systems that could not absorb nutrients from the soil. The main disadvantage of using this technique as a way to get nutrients to the plants is that there's very short dwell time when fertilizer is applied, whereas for, uh, for existing soil or substrate, it is ever-present, so the, the plant can receive nutrients from the root 24-7. If one applies fertilizer through a spray, you know, the, after a while the water evaporates or it drips to the ground or it gets washed away by rain. So for terrestrial uh, plantations, this technique is mainly used to supplement deficiencies or cure deficiencies rather than as a core way of supplying nutrients to the plants. 
However, these are disadvantages that do not exist in an aquarium where the plant is soaked in solution 24-7. In a scientific paper, scientists conducted an experiment where they took four species of aquatic plants and cut off the roots of the plants while still allowing the plant access to nutrient-rich water. They realized that the plants grew just fine as they could take water, nutrients from the water supply and the lack of roots did not impede the plant's growth whatsoever. The exact summary of the text is displayed here. At the hobbies level, one can also run such experiments to test this for ourselves. In this particular example, the hobbies use a plain substrate, just plain sand, but with osmocote plus on only one side of the tank. He then planted similar, similar plants on either side, including plants such as creeps and swords, who many people call root feeders. He then dosed the water column using the EI dosing regimen. So plants on both sides of the tank get access to the nutrient-rich water, however only one side has access to osmocote plus beneath the plain sand. And these are the growth results after 6 weeks. There are some minor differences between the left and right side. So certain plants on the right are slightly more, slightly larger, slightly more robust. But generally, it shows that even creeps and swords, so-called heavy root feeders, do not require substrate fertilization to grow well. They feed off the water column just fine. Interestingly, the plant that did significantly better with the substrate fertilization was the Autonentora rhinicki. In my own tanks, where I started out using a rich dirt substrate, there is almost no difference between the sites that had Osmocote Plus or not. Regarding roots, there is little relationship between the size of roots and root systems and whether the plant prefers to uptake nutrients through that root. Terrestrial trees can have huge root systems, but they can feed through their leaves and bark just fine as well. Aquatic plants that grow in a fast-growing stream have large root systems so that they do not get washed away and for anchoring purposes, and it has nothing to do with whether they prefer to feed through their roots. However, many plants that can grow on wood and rocks nonetheless grow faster if their roots are rooted into substrate. So in this example, Tom, uh, Tom Ba farms his white anubias using soy substrate. Some concluding remarks. Generally, most plants can feed from both the water column and substrate, and they'll take nutrients from either location wherever it's available. The term root feeder as used commonly to describe plants such as creeps, swords or lotuses is a complete misnomer. Most of the easier plants can grow with water fertilization alone, regardless of how large their root system seem to be. On the other hand, many of the difficult varieties may benefit from a richer substrate, stuff like HC as well as some Iriocolons. I'm sure that there are people who grow them in plain sand as well, but it is much easier to propagate them if you are using soy. There are also many benefits to soy that I've described in this video. It includes the bacterial interactions that we get that you will not get if you are using just a plain sand substrate. The slow decomposition of organic materials also acts as a slow release of fertilizer. Having a high CEC substrate is like having a large storehouse that is ever present for your plants to feed on. Even if your water fertilization laps, they, your plants can still feed through the substrate. For this reason alone, I think it's good to use a rich substrate. For tanks that run using more alkaline waters, that means you have a higher KH. Iron fertilizer generally precipitates out of alkaline water faster compared to softer water. You can increase the iron availability to the plants by using an acidic substrate in such cases. If you have not had a chance to try a rich dirt substrate, I strongly encourage you to do so. Both your livestock as well as your plants will thank you for it. With that, I've come to the end of my video. Thanks for watching guys.